here, everybody. At the end of the presentation, Steve will answer your questions. We are going to have a drawing for a book. So um, anyone who's here present tonight will get involved in that drawing and I will be giving away a free book. It's signed too. Steve always says a really great thing. It's our duty to remember Steve Snyder. I love you, Steve. You're so awesome. That is just what we're about. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So how to purchase a book. We're going to have a book giveaway and you can go online on our website, b17alliance.com and purchase a book. And it's because you are supporters, I'm giving you a secret code. Put in what at checkout, members, and you will get additional $4 off on the book. Okay, so Steve is here from Arizona, right, Steve? I'm in Sedona, Arizona right now, yeah. Very good, and I was really excited. We had a little run through the other night to make sure everything worked, and I was just so excited to, for you to get to hear all you people out there that we have a great showing tonight too, so thank you for being here. We really appreciate your support, and this is a big thank you to you, because Steve is a great guy and he has a wonderful story. So without further ado, here he is. Okay, well, thank you, Terry. Let me uh, try to share my screen here to start my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Give me a minute. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. <clears throat> I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to present tonight. Uh, the B-17 Alliance is a, a, a great organization with great people. I've been up to, uh, to see the Lacey Lady a couple times and look forward to uh, another visit one of these days. So I'll start my presentation uh, about my book, Shot Down, the true story of pilot Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17, Susan Roof. Uh, growing up, I knew the basics of my dad's World War II history. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in England with the 8th Air Force. His plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. He flew bombing missions over occupied Europe. In February of 1944, his plane was shot down. And my dad was missing in action for seven months, but he evaded capture and made it back to England. But it wasn't until I retired in 2009 that I really had the time to delved into my dad's uh, war history in more detail. My parents had kept a lot of material from the war years, and I just wanted to go through that and organize it, learn more details. And at that time, I had no uh, uh, idea about writing a book. Uh, I just wanted to learn more. But there were two items that were really significant um, material that my parents had kept. And one was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action about his plane being shot down, which is absolutely riveting. Uh, so much so that it was included in two books that were written. Uh, <clears throat> one was The Mighty Eighth by Gerald Astor about the Eighth Air Force that was stationed in England during the war. Uh, they flew high altitude daylight precision bombing missions over occupied Europe and Germany. Their goal was to bomb military and industrial targets to cripple Nazi Germany's ability to wait for. Uh, the moniker of the Money Eighth was assigned or came up with by a noted historian, Roger Freeman, because of the number of planes they could put up on missions, which numbered into the hundreds. And on December 24th of 1944, 2,000 bombers hit targets around Berlin. I mean, I get excited when I see one B-17, you know, the Lacey Lady or, or one of the flying B-17s, but can you imagine having 2,000 bombers going overhead? Incredible. Uh, the other book was First Over Germany by uh, Russell Strong. It was about the 306 bomb group that my dad was in. Russell Strong was a navigator in the 306 bomb group. Uh, the motto of the 306 was First Over Germany because they were the first bomb group to hit a target in Germany, Wilhelmshaven on January 27th of 1940. Uh, the other item that was really significant was uh, all the letters that my dad had written to my mother while he was stationed in England before his plane got shot down. And he was very candid in those 
letters. He talks about what bombing missions were like, uh, what life was like in London and England at the time, what life was like on the air base, uh, escapades of him and his crew. And I just became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe. I went on the internet, and spent countless hours doing research, downloading declassified military documents. I went on a quest to find relatives of all of my dad's crew and ask them for any information they could give to me. I started going to uh, World War II uh, veterans reunions, listening to the vets tell their stories. And finally, three years into my research, I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so, in, so unique and so compelling that it needed to be told, needed to, people needed to read about it. So I decided to write a book. Uh, the first half of the book builds up to the day that the plane was shot down. And the second half of the book is all about what happens afterwards. And it's just not about my dad, but it's about what happened to each member of the crew because something different happened to each guy. And it's also about all the Belgium people that risked their lives trying to help my dad and but I probably wouldn't have written the book if it wasn't for two Belgian gentlemen. Uh, on the left, you see my dad with his uh, A2 jacket on with Dr. Paul Delahaye. That picture was taken in 1994, the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium. And then the, the photo on the right is of me and Jacques Lelot. That was taken 20 years later at the 70th anniversary. Both these men were young boys during the war and they were greatly affected by it. They saw firsthand atrocities committed against their family and friends. And they became uh, local historians later in life. And they interviewed all these Belgian people and members of the Belgium underground about events that took place involving my dad and his crew. And they documented their testimony. And they gave me unbelievably detailed information about events that took place that would have been lost forever without their dedicated research. So I owe them a huge debt. Initially, my dad didn't go to the Air Force as a result of the first peacetime draft uh, initiated in, in the fall of 1940 by President Franklin Roosevelt. My dad went into the, joined the service in April of 1941, and he went to the Army, and he was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. And at the time, prior to the war starting, the U.S. military was woefully weak. They were ranked 18th in the world in military strength. We we're very ill-equipped as well, as you can tell by the World War I vintage uniform that my dad has on here. Well, three months later in July, uh, my dad married Ruth Hempel at uh, First Lutheran Church in Pasadena, California. Uh, it was right after he gra she graduated from UCLA, where she was a classmate of the legendary Jackie Robinson. Um, my mother was born and raised in Pasadena, as was I. I also went to UCLA. Uh, my dad was from Norfolk, Nebraska, and he moved to California with his family uh, when he was 13 years old, just prior to starting high school. Well, a few months later, on December 7th, 1941, date that will live in infamy, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in the United States with a war. My mother was very concerned at the time. The future was very uncertain. She was very afraid. So that Christmas, she went up to Washington to visit my dad. And nine months later, Susan Ruth was born. Well, at the time, my dad was concerned how he was going to support his new family as a new bride, a, a baby on the way. And he didn't think he could do that very well on a private pay in the Army. So he decided to join the Air Force, where he could earn more money, especially if he could make it through pilot training and become an officer. So in June of 1942, my dad went through pre-flight training at Santa Ana, California and then through the various stages of pilot training. There were three basic or main stages you can see on the, the, the left of the, the screen here. The first was primary. And then if uh, the cadets made it through primary, they went on to basic and pilot training was very rough. 40% of the cadets that entered washed out and didn't make it through. They became bombardiers or, or navigators or perhaps uh, gunners. Then after basic, they went into advanced pilot training, and that's when they separated the pilots out. Uh, they either went into single engine planes or fighters, or they went into twin engine planes, which resulted in uh, transports or bombers. Uh, typically, the shorter pilots went into 
fighters because of the cramped conditions in the cockpit. My dad was six foot three, so he went into uh, an engine uh, advanced training. But I think it also depended on the personality of these pilots. Uh, I personally feel that uh, these the, the fighter pilots, they tended to be, you know, have pretty big egos, be cocky, independent, risk takers, as, as opposed to the bomber pilots that tended to be a little more level-headed than team players. Here you see my dad in primary training at Santa Ana, California. This was a big day for my dad. Uh, you can see he's wearing his goggles uh, on top of his helmet and you couldn't do that until you'd solo. So this was the first day my dad soloed. So that was a big day in his uh, aviation career. You see he's smoking there. I think about everyone back then smoked. So the three planes that my dad flew during pilot training in primary up on top, he flew a Stearman biplane. And then in basic training, he flew a, a single wing Volte Valiant. And then in advanced training, it was a twin engine, uh, Curtis Wright, 18-9. He graduated from pilot training in Douglas, Arizona in April of 1943, where he earned his commission as a second lieutenant in his pilot's wing. And then uh, from there, he went on to transitional training where he learned how to fly a four engine Beach 17 bomber in Pio, Texas. And then from there, he went to Dalhart, Texas, where the various members of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. And then once deemed ready, they were assigned overseas to the European Theater of Operations. On October 21st, 1943, my dad and his crew reported to the 306 bomb group at Thurlai, England. Uh, Thurlai is about 60 miles north of London. This is what the base looked like back, uh, back then. It's no longer there, but the surrounding countryside pretty much looks the same with these little farms and you know, small country roads. Well, there is a nice little museum there uh, my, that my wife and I have been to a couple of times, which is uh, really special. Here you see the insignia of the 306 bomb group. In the 8th Air Force, there were three air divisions. Uh, the 306 was in the 1st Air Division, which was signified by a triangle. And then each bomb group that was in the mighty 8th Air Force was signified by a letter. The 306 bomb group was signified by the letter H. So you have the triangle H. Not only was the 306 bomb group the first bomb group to hit a target in Germany, but they were the longest serving bomb group in the 8th Air Force. They reported to England in the se September of 1942, and they didn't return home until December of 1946. They stayed on after the war involved in the Casey Jones project was the photo, photo aerial mapping of Western Europe and Northern Africa. Most of you have seen uh, most likely the movie 12 O'Clock High starring Greg Peck. Well, that was based on a true story about the 306 bomb group. But the fictitious bomb group in the movie, the 918th, was derived by multiplying the 306 by three. Another distinction the 306 bomb group had was that their flight surgeon, Dr. Thurman Schuler, was responsible for convincing 8th Bomber Command uh, General Ira Ecker to implement a mission limit in the spring of 1943. Up until that time, there were no mission limits. These bomber uh, combat crews would just keep flying, and pretty soon they learned or figured out that they would never make it back home. Either they would be killed or they'd be shot down and become prisoners of war. And the morale was going into the tank. So uh, Dr. Schuler suggested that they implement a mission limit of 20. Uh, General Aker said it at 25, but at least they had a light at the end of the tunnel and something they could shoot at and uh, have the belief that maybe they could make it back home. Every bomb group had four bomb squadrons. It is a the, the four bomb squadrons in the 306 bomb group on the other, upper left, you have the uh, 367th Clay Pigeons, uh, so named by a journalist because they took horrendous uh, casualties during World War II. And then to the right is the 368th Eager Beavers and down to the lower left, the uh, Grim Reapers, and then my dad's squadron, the th uh, 369th Fight and Bike. I always like to point out the ground crews. Uh, the combat crews received all the recognition and all the glory, but it was these uh, ground crews that really 
kept these planes flying. After a mission, uh, these bombers would come back and they'd be all shot up. Uh, the bombers, these uh, ground crews would stay up all during the night in very inclement weather, sleet, rain, snow, doing uh, repairs on the plane, repairing battle damage, doing maintenance, replacing engines, replacing tires. And they really considered th these bombers their planes. Uh, they took great, great pride in their work. And they just considered that, that they lend out these planes occasionally to the combat crews to fly. So they really for the unsung heroes. Here you see my dad's crew. B-17 had a 10-man crew. There were four uh, officers kneeling in front. Uh, this is my dad on the lower left. Uh, he was the lead pilot, and as such, the commander of the crew and the plane. And then you're going across, you have the co-pilot, navigator, and the bombardier. And then behind them were uh, six enlisted officers, non-commissioned officers, as you say, who were mainly gunners. Five of these men came back, but five of them did not. Uh, this is not the Susan Ruth. That was just another B-17 that they took the crew picture in front of after they arrived uh, in England. And I like to point out the uh, the nose art here on, on the plane. I love, love the nose art. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Air Force was the only entity that allowed their planes to be painted. Uh, the Navy didn't, the Marines didn't, or the, the other countries. The Air Force thought it would help the morale of these young guys if they could paint and name their planes, personalize their planes. And they're very creative in what they named and painted their planes. Many times it was a cartoon character, but more often than not, you know, it was a scantily clad or nude woman. After all, these guys are in their late teens, in their early 20s, and very young men. Uh, the 306 bomb group flew uh, B-17 bombers, uh, as did the, the 3rd Air Division. Uh, the other Air Division in the, in the 8th Air Force, the 2nd Air Division flew, flew B-24 Liberators. Uh, B-17 was nicknamed the Flying Fortress because they had 13 50 caliber machine guns on the plane. And put out a tremendous amount of firepower. Power. And also, they could take a tremendous amount of battle damage and continue flying. Uh, in Europe, there were three models of the B-17 that were flown. The first was the E model, but they only built about 500 of those, so they were quickly phased out by the F model. And then they were phased out in the fall of 1943 by the definitive uh, B-17 model, the G model. Uh, you can always tell the G model by the chin turret underneath the nose of the plane. Uh, every B-17, or a bomber for that matter, had identification numbers, tail markings on the plane. Here again, you see the triangle of the 1st Air Division and the 8th of the 306 bomb group. And then they had identification number on the plane that was assigned by the manufacturer of the bombers. The, B, uh, the Boeing company produced, well, actually designed and produced 64% uh, of the B-17s, but the uh, Lockheed Vega and the Douglas Aircraft Company also each produced 18%. Here you see the crew positions on the plane. Again, this was the, the G model with the chin turret up in the nose of the plane. You had the navigator, the bombardier, the two pilots, the flight engineer, the bomb bay, the radio operator, the belly gunner, two tail gunners, and then the waist gunner. And the, bomb bay, the bombs hung on racks in the bomb bay. Uh, here you can see them hanging there on the racks. And there was a narrow catwalk that's going through the bomb bay. This young boy is only eight years old. You can see how narrow that, how cramped that was in there. And if you've never been inside a B-17, you, you really have no idea how cramped it was. It was more cramped than a B-17 than a submarine. And occasionally on bomb runs, these bombs would get hung up on these racks, which require a, a member of the crew to either kick it loose with his foot, take a wrench, and knock it loose. And when these bomb bay doors are open, you're looking five miles straight down to the ground with the wind howling around you. That, so that took some courage to do that. Here you see the crew positions a little more clearly. This was the F model without the uh, gin turret. Here you have the, the bombardier and his main uh, mission was to drop the bomb successfully, but in the G model, he manned the chin turret 
when they were under attack by enemy fighters. And then behind him, you had the navigator that needed to know where they were going and where they were. And then when they went under attack by German fighters, he manned chin turrets, one of which were on each side of the plane. Then above them, you have the two pilots. The first pilot sat in the left seat. Uh, the co-pilot sat in the right seat. And you needed two pilots to fly these planes. And not just because if one was injured or killed, you had another pilot to fly the plane. But it took a lot of uh, energy to fly these planes. It was very stressful, both mentally and physically, to fly these bombers. Back then, you really had to have some muscle. It wasn't like today. Everything was kind of on the autopilot. Uh, these missions were six to 10 hours of length, so it was very tiring. They flew in tight formation, so the pilots had to be alert at all times. So they'd clip a wing on the plane next to them or run into the plane and in front of them, they'd go down. And also they had to continually fight, fight the uh, turbulence. Not only the turbulence from the weather that many of you have been in, you know, when the plane's bouncing all around, but also with all those bombers being in such close proximity to one another, the uh, wake turbulence and prop wash just churned the air up. So they really had to fight, keeping their planes uh, steady and on course. Then above them, you had the uh, flight engineer. When they were under attack, he manned the top turret. Flight engineer was also called the crew chief. He knew how everything operated on the plane. He was kind of the onboard mechanic. And he helped monitor all the instruments that were in the cockpit. There were over 250 dial switches, toggles uh, in the control panel here. And the flight engineer peered over the pilot's shoulders to help monitor uh, engine performance, and fuel consumption. And uh, behind the bomb bay, you had the radio operator. That was the most comfortable position on the plane. He, uh, he had kind of a roomy compartment, a chair to sit at. And the most cramped position on the plane was the ball turret underneath the plane. Again, these missions were six to 10 hours, and he was in a fetal position all for most of that time, which was very uncomfortable. And above the ball turret, you had two waste gunners, which were the most exposed positions on the plane, and then another very cramped position on the plane, the tail gunner. My dad flew his first mission on October, or excuse me, November 3rd of 1943, the mission to Wilhelmshaven. It was the first time the 8th Air Force put up over 500 bombers on a mission. And flying combat was unbelievably brutal and extremely dangerous. 26,000 men died in the 8th Air Force, which was more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific. Another 28,000 men in the 8th Air Force became prisoners of war after their bombers were knocked out of the sky by either German fighters or anti-aircraft fire. Being a combat crewman in the 8th Air Force was the most dangerous duty assignment in the United States military during World War II. And it was dangerous from the time they took off from the time they landed. Uh, at its height, the 8th Air Force had 40 bomb groups located in an area of England called East Anglia, which was about the size of Vermont. And these bases were located only about five to 10 miles apart. So on the day of a mission, you had hundreds of these bombers taken off all at the same time. And back then there was no air traffic control, there was no radar. Uh, so you couldn't see anything because of the lousy English weather most of the time, being fogged in and overcast. So they couldn't see anything until they got above the cloud layer. So mid-air collisions were not uncommon trying to form up. And it took an hour to two hours for them to form up. Individual planes had to form up into three plane elements. Elements formed up into bomb squadrons. Bomb squadrons formed up into bomb groups. Bomb groups formed up into air divisions. I mean, in, excuse me, into combat wings. Combat wings formed up into air divisions. And all this took place before they could even start their journey across the English Channel. And then they had to deal with the elements. These planes weren't pressurized back then, so above 10,000 feet, they had to go on oxygen or else they'd quickly pass out and, and die. And then it was extremely cold at that altitude that they were flying. It was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero. 
So frostbite was a huge problem. And many airmen suffered uh, serious frostbite injuries that required lengthy uh, stays in the hospital. One of my dad's uh, waist gunners, John Pendrock, was in the hospital for two and a half months from frostbite injury. injury. Here you see the combat uniform uh, that they wore. This is uh, a waist gunner. Here you see his uh, steel helmet, his tinted goggles because of the brightness of the altitude of the, the sky at that altitude, his oxygen mask. This was a flak jacket that they wore. It was a metal apron that had, uh, it was a, a apron that had metal plates in the front and the back to help protect them. Here is fleece lined jacket, fleece lined pants, thermal boots, and thermal uh, gloves. And here you see this uh, belt here, that was their uh, parachute harness. And they didn't actually wear their parachutes in the plane because it was so cramped. So if they needed to bail out, they had to have their wits about them to find their parachute to begin with, and then clip it on hooks on the back of the harness and then bail out of the plane. Uh, here you see the nose art again. This is actually a B-24, not a B-17. The next thing they had to deal with enemy fighters. Uh, Germany had uh, radar stations set up along the continental coast of Europe. So the Germans knew when these bomber formations were crossing the channel and, and heading over the, into their territory. And then they'd send up their air force, the Luftwaffe, to intercept them. At the beginning of the war, it was 8th Bomber Command's belief that these heavily you know, armed bombers with all these machine guns and flying in tight formations and hundreds of bombers at a time could defend themselves from the Luftwaffe. And they flew, well, well I forgot about this one, excuse me. Here, here you have another image of a, a waste gunner firing his 50 caliber machine guns fighting off the Luftwaffe, again with his black jacket. You see all these spent shells down here on the floor. And that was like stepping on ball bearings or marbles. Uh, the ammunition for these guns came in belts of 27 feet long. Well, they said if a gunner fired the whole belt, he fired the whole nine yards. As I was mentioning, uh, they therefore thought they could fly, they could defend themselves from the German Luftwaffe. They flew in what was called a combat box formation. And here you see the box of a combat wing. And then within each box of a wing, you had three boxes representing bomb groups. And then within each box of the bomb group, you had three bomb squadrons. And the theory was that all this interlacing firepower could ward off the German fighters. But unfortunately, uh, that was not the case. Uh, in the early years of the war, the 8th Air Force took devastating losses in 1942 and in 1943. Even though that they implemented that mission limit of 25 uh, in the spring of 43, it was statistically impossible to complete 25 missions. In 1943, the average number of missions flown before being shot down was only six. And the losses culminated in the fall of 1943 in October during a week which is called Black Week, during which four missions to Germany resulted in 15 or, or 100, 1,500 bombers being shot down. The worst day was October 14th, Black Thursday, when on a mission to Schweinfurt, Germany, to bomb the ball, fairing, ball bearing factories, uh, they sent up 291 bombers and 60 of them were shot down, 600 men. A 306 bomb group on that mission, they lost 10 out of the 15 B-17s that went on that mission. Well, after Black Week, the 8th Air Force was in shock. There was no way they could continue to sustain, sustain those losses and continue daylight bombing operations. And they seriously con considered continuing bombing operations. It wasn't until the end of 1943 and the beginning of 1944 when external fuel tanks were added to the P-47 Thunderbolts and the introduction of the P-51 Mustangs that these bomber formations finally had escorts that could take them all the way deep into Germany and escort them all the way back uh, to their bases. 
P51 Mustangs were particularly effective. Uh, they basically wiped out the Luftwaffe uh, prior to D-Day, June 6th, rolled the skies in the air supremacy. Here you see the bomber formations, uh, again, a different angle. Uh, here you see them uh, from the back, uh, from on top and from the side. It was a three-dimensional formation with a lead squadron, a high group, and then a low group. The next thing they had to worry about was anti-aircraft fire. Here you see a German flak gun. Uh, flak was the abbreviation for the German word for aircraft hit the fence cannon. These were deadly weapons. They fired 20 shells a minute and they were calibrated to explode at the same altitude that the bombers were flying. These shells were filled with all different shapes and sizes of razor sharp metal. And when they exploded, they burst out hundreds of feet and could easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of these bombers. Uh, they were so thin that you could take a screwdriver and just poke it right through them. From a distance, uh, these puff, these anti-aircraft shells exploding look like innocent little black puffs. But as these bomber formations got closer, those pop puffs got bigger, the explosions got louder. And then once among this killing field, they the concussions from the shells exploding would just violently rock the ships. My dad said that even though it was so cold at that altitude, during these bomb runs, he'd be dripping with sweat and his clothes would be just soaked. When they neared the target, uh, the first pilot gave the command of the plane over to the bombardier who flew the plane in the bomb run using the Norden bomb site. It was a revolutionary device at the time. It was tied into the uh, autopilot of the plane. And it could calculate various factors, such as the speed of the plane, the altitude of the plane, wind speed, crosswind, so they could accurately drop the bombs. They were highly secretive. A bombardier had to take an oath to defend the Norden bomb site with his life. Little did the US know that at the time, the Germans knew all about the Norden bomb site. They had a spy in the factory, Hermann Lang, that relayed all the specs of the bomb site back to Germany. He was eventually captured and spent 18 years in prison. Here you see the bombardier looking through the crossed hairs of the bomb site. And once he released the bombs, he'd yell, bombs away. And that would signify or signal the first pilot to take control of the plane again. And then he would make a big turn and go to another pre designated point called the rally point where all the bombers that made it through the bomb run would try to form up again and then head back to their bases in England, but once again have to face enemy fighters. And then once they came back to England, they had a number of dangers to face. Uh, again, the weather was usually uh, most often pretty bad and they couldn't even find their bases because of the overcast. Uh, they had injured and killed crewmen on board. Uh, they had battle damage. A lot of these bombers uh, were shot up and they had uh, engines out, uh, landing gear that couldn't come down, uh, instruments that were sh they're shot out. And as a result, again, you know, crashes were not uncommon and more airmen died. It was on a bombing mission to Frankfurt, Germany on February 8th of 1944 when my dad's plane dropped their bombs successfully, but their bomb bay doors got hit by flak. And as a result, they couldn't get them back up. And as a result, that caused a drag on the plane and they started losing airspeed and they couldn't keep up with the bomber formation coming back to England. As a result, they were singled out by two German Falk Wolf fighters, like wolves or lions, you know, dived in to their prey and in the ensuing air battle, the Susan Ruth was shot down. Uh, two of the 10 crewmen were killed in the plane. The other eight crewmen were able to bail out successfully. But both those German Falk Wolf fighters were shot down as well. One crashed, uh, piloted by Siegfried Merrick and he died in the plane. The other one was piloted by Hans Berger who was able to bail out and uh, made it through the war. Uh, during my research, well, one day my wife, Glenda, asked me, or told me, I should say, 
why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? And I thought, well, that's a ridiculous idea. She has no clue what she's talking about. She's, she's naive. There's no one in the world I could do that. But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do. And lo and behold, I found Hans Berger. And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war. So he spoke perfect English. He gave me some wonderful insight about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force in the book. And not only did I find out that he was shot down, but he was shot down by the gunners on my dad's plane. They actually shot each other down. Pretty amazing. After my dad bailed out, uh, he came down right at the French-Belgian border, planted in some trees. And this is a picture that was sent to him by one of the Belgium helpers. Uh, there's over 200 time period photographs in the book. So you can visualize everything that you're reading about. And my dad's parachute got hung up on the branches. And he was dangling 20 feet off the ground and he couldn't get down. But fortunately for him, a couple young Belgian men, Henri Franken and Raymond Dervin, came to his rescue before the Germans got to him. Uh, this occurred uh, in early afternoon. They told him to stay put and hide. They'd come back that night to get him because they thought it was too dangerous for him to try to move him during daylight when German patrols were combing the area. Here you see uh, Henri Franken, one of the two men that helped my dad down this tree. Uh, this was a pic uh, photo that Henri sent back to my dad after the war was over. That night they came back and got him and they took him to the Duvan farmhouse, which is right at the French-Belgian border. That house is still there today. Uh, these trees are in France, but the house is in Belgium. So it was right at the border. He spent one night there. They thought it was too dangerous for him to stay there any longer than that. Again, with those German patrols combing the area. So the following night, a Belgian customs officer, Paul Dilken, uh, came in a tandem bicycle uh, to pick up my dad and take him to a, a safer location. So they headed out the next night. It was uh, the middle of the night. My dad says, it's black, raining. Uh, he had some shrapnel wounds uh, from the anti-aircraft fire in one of his legs, so he could only pedal uh, with his good leg. And they came to a hill, and they couldn't pedal up at it anymore, so they just got off the bike and started walking up the hill. And when they got to the crest of the hill, they came to a, a building. This is what it looked like in 1994. But at the time, it was a cabaret, a little cafe. There were, uh, the lights were on, music was playing. People were laughing, talking loudly. And all of a sudden, two German officers come out that door with arms around two young uh, women. And one of them comes up to my dad and asks him for a light for his cigarette. But my dad couldn't speak German or French at, at that time. But fortunately, Paul knew what the guy wanted and lit his cigarette and they let him go on their way. Uh, my dad said that these two German officers were so schnockered, as he put it, drunk and too interested in these young girls. He really paid too much attention to a couple of guys just pushing a bike up. Uh, this road in the middle of the night. And after that, he was moved from place to place to place. How long he stayed in any given location depended on how brave the Belgian people were who lived there and how dangerous the Belgian underground thought it was for him to stay there. He might spend one night, he might spend six weeks. He had many uh, Belgian helpers. Here you see a few of them. And the people who helped my dad and other members of his crew, for that matter, are unbelievably brave people. They risked not only their lives, but the lives of their family and friends. Because if the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out about, about it, they would be arrested, tortured, and either shot or sent to a concentration camp. And some of the people who helped my dad and other members of his crew didn't meet that fate. Uh, this is my dad here on the left. As you can see, he was quite a bit taller. <laughs> And the locals, uh, they put a beret on him to help him kind of blend in uh, with the locals. Uh, here you see two women that he spent lengthy periods of time with. That's Gis Gislaine Bayou on the left. It was with her and her husband, Maurice. My dad wrote his diary. Uh, and then on the right is Jeanette Guitin. Uh, her husband was a captain in the French army who was captured when Germany first in 
invaded the lowlands in uh, May of 1940, and he was a prisoner of war for the remainder of the conflict. It, uh, normally when uh, underground came across down airmen, they tried to get him back to England through various escape routes, down through France, over the Pyrenees into Spain, and now through British control Gibraltar. But something always went wrong trying to get my dad out. And uh, it was a very stressful time for him. You know, after all, his plane was attacked, it was on fire, he has to bail out. He came down in a foreign country, has no idea where he is, uh, doesn't know what happened to his buddies on the plane, can't communicate with the US military. And here he's being helped by complete strangers. They can't speak each other's language. My dad had a little French English dictionary that he could refer to refer to. And any of these people that were helping him could be a collaborator and turn him over to the Gestapo. And there were several occasions where he almost got discovered, which were described in the book. Uh, one was at the home of Maurice and Ghislaine Mayhew in Charleroi. Um, this is a house I've been in there. You can't really uh, see it too much with this, the house, the, the, there's an attic up here on top of the house, and a tile roof, which is very slanted. And one evening there was a loud pounding on the door uh, and the Maurice told my dad to get up on the roof uh, to hide from the Germans. And then he'd come up, back and get him uh, once it was safe. Well, Maurice never came back the entire night because the Germans just didn't leave the area. And I've been in that attic and there's just a really tiny, small window that you can crawl out of. And that roof is at a very, slope. And I can imagine being up there all night in the cold of this tile roof. <laughs> it had to be quite a, a scary experience. But finally, my dad got tired of hiding. Uh, word came that uh, the Allies landed at Normandy on June 6th the 44, and my dad decided to get back into the fight. Unlike most airmen, uh, he had that year's experience in the Army, so he knew how to fight on the ground. And he, he decided to join the French resistance. His uh, helpers tried vehemently to talk him out of it because it was too dangerous. He'd either die fighting against the Germans or if he was captured, he'd be shot on the spot as a ply, as a spy. But uh, he, he thought it was his duty uh, to get back in the war. So he crossed the border. Uh, this is uh, Amy Cools, another one of his helpers. They crossed the border from Belgium into France on uh, bicycles. He joined up with a unit of the French resistance called the Mackey. Uh, this is not the unit he joined, but this is typically what they look like. Uh, the Mackey was were a bunch of independent ragtag guerrilla groups located all across France. Their assignment was basically to harass the Germans. They would disrupt communications. Uh, sabotage railroad lines, uh, attack German convoys, assassinate German officers. And uh, they were supplied by the British through airdrops and they got their instructions also from the Brit British through coded messages over the BBC. And uh, my dad said, when they said that there'd be a German convoy coming down this road on this date at that time, sure enough, they'd be there. And that was the result of the British cracking the German Enigma code and knowing everything that the Germans were up to. There were about 20 uh, guys in my dad's unit. They were read by, read, led by a French lieutenant who had escaped from a German prisoner of war camp. There were some Belgians, some French men, and uh, also some Algerians that my dad said were ferocious fighters. Uh, here was the farm uh, that they stayed in just across the border in France, in Wallers, France. This is a picture of my dad in the, in the front of the farmhouse in 1994 that I took. He stayed uh, in this tower where you see these two windows here. And on one occasion, uh, early in the morning, he was shaving. He just had his skivvies on, shaving cream in his face. And he saw a German patrol coming up the road to the farmhouse. So he jumped out of these windows uh, and hightailed it in the woods so he wouldn't be captured. And I've been in this farmhouse, I've been in that room that he was uh, stayed at. Uh, it's just living history uh, right there, which is an amazing feeling to, uh, 
be there. Here you see my dad fighting with the French resistance. Who took this picture and how it got back to my dad, I'll never know. But this is him fighting with the resistance in 1944. Finally, seven months after he bailed out, work, word came that there were US troops in a nearby village of Trelon, France. So he walked into the town and the town square went up to a army major. It was actually a element of Patton's third army, which had come up through France after D-Day identified himself, uh, they interrogated him to make sure he was who he said he was. Then he uh, hopped, uh, hopped a ride on a convoy taking German prisoners to Paris and then uh, hopped the transport back to uh, England where he sent a Western Union telegram to my mother saying, fit as a fiddle, honey, bank the money. He had all that back pay from coming those, being in, missing in action for those seven months. Belgium is a very unique country. A lot of people don't realize it's really divided in two. The upper half of Belgium is uh, called Flanders, they, which is rather industrial, and they speak uh, Flanders, Flemish or Dutch. And then the bottom portion of Belgium is called Wallonia, where they speak French, and it's very rural farmland. Uh, my dad's uh, at plane and the guys who bailed out came down uh, right at the French-Belgium border. Actually, my dad on the plane came down in Belgium and the other guys that were bailed out came down in France. And then the resistance took them over into Belgium. Here at Charleroi, where my dad stayed for a while with various people. And then uh, the farmhouse that the French resistance group stayed in in Prelon, France, is just right across the border. The Belgian people are wonderful people. To this day, they are still so thankful and so grateful for the Americans coming to their rescue and liberated them from four years of Nazi occupation and Nazi oppression. And they do a wonderful job of educating the younger generations about the importance. Uh, I've erected a number of memorials in the area where they have ceremonies on the anniversary of those events to remember them and, and honor what took place. Big celebrations are always around September 2nd which was the anniversary date with the Belgium liberation. This is a poster from the 70th anniversary. And, uh, and there's that and the, they last several days. Uh, they erect these huge tents uh, that seat hundreds of people. This is just a portion of one and they have lunches and dinners and dances and uh, band concerts and they're wonderful events. Uh, the volunteers dress up in uh, you know, time period uniforms, they have uh, U.S. military vehicle parades, and they have a U.S. military uh, camp, and the local beer chimay just flows, and everyone has a very jolly time. But they also have uh, more solemn occasions where they have ceremonies at these various memorials. This is the memorial at Sendron, which was right at the French-Belgian border. The 9th U.S. Infantry first crossed over from France across the Wartraz River to liberate Belgium. When all the dignitaries come out, all the villagers uh, show up, uh, the US military is there, the Belgian military, the French military. And again, you see all the young people right up front here emphasizing the importance of these events. Here's a memorial that was erected to my dad and his crew in 1989. And like most, US, uh, most World War II veterans, my dad didn't talk a lot about the war until he went over with three other members of his crew that were still living at the time for the dedication of the memorial. And there he was reunited with people that hid him during the war, revisited these places where he was hidden, and that brought it all back and he started talking about it after that. Here you see my dad at the dedication of the memorial. This is Dr. Paul Delahaye that I mentioned earlier. Uh, here's my dad and then three of his helpers. This is Jeanette Gaden, who was in that earlier photo that I showed you. This is uh, Nellie Tilken, that was a wife of the Belgium customs officer, Paul Tilken, who came and took my dad on that tandem bicycle. A couple months after he helped my dad, he was arrested by the Gestapo, uh, tortured, sent to prison, and narrowly escaped being executed. But he died at a fairly young age because of the beatings and torture. 
And then this gentleman is Raymond Dervan. He was that other young uh, Belgium that helped my dad down from the trees. I've been to Belgium six times and on two of those trips, I've continued on to Munich, Germany to visit that Luftwaffe pilot that shot down my dad's plane, Hans Berger. Uh, this is at his apartment in Munich. Uh, here he is uh, in his apartment. He has his fighter jacket on wearing his iron cross. He shot down seven B-17s and one Spitfire. He himself was shot down by three excuse me, he was shot down three times and made it through the war and most all of his friends uh, were shot down. And a lot of people ask me, well, how can you like this guy that shot down your dad's plane? But Hans and I have developed a, a, a wonderful friendship. Now, he was pretty much like uh, US flyers. He was 19, 20 years old at the time, you know, fighting for his country, trying to do a job and uh, trying to stay alive. Uh, he said it was unfortunate they had to be shooting at each other, but that was war. He probably wouldn't have made it through the war, except near the end, he became a test pilot for the Henkel HC-162 single engine uh, jet fighter that the Nazis were trying to develop and never really got into the war. But that probably, probably saved his life. Uh, here after his apartment, went over to the Hofbrau house to uh, have a nice uh, Augustiner beer. So I, I cherish Hans's friendship. Uh, there was no other event in history that affected my dad more than World War II. It was the defining moment of his life. And at one point in time, my father's life and Hans's life crossed paths. So Hans is a part of my dad's life. He's a part of my story. My dad's story, I'd say. Here you see my dad and I uh, in 2004 at the World War II Memorial. He wanted to see it before he died. I accompanied him uh, to a reunion uh, for the Air, Force Efe uh, Air Force's Escape and Evasion Society. And this was right before this, its official dedication. And that was the last trip he ever took. Three years later in 2007, my dad died at the age of 91. He wasn't the last crew member to die, but he was the oldest. And virtually all the World War II veterans are in their 90s or hundreds today. Uh, this chart is a little outdated, but at the end of the war, there were 16 million veterans. And today there's less than 3% of those great men left. There was no other event in history that affected more people than World War II. 60 million people died. Millions more were wounded. Millions more were left homeless and displaced. Changed the courts in the United States forever. And the brave young men who fought and died for freedom must never be forgotten. It is our duty to remember. Thank you. End of my presentation. Anyone still there? Oh. I wasn't ready. I didn't realize it was time. Oh, okay. So that was fabulous. I'm kind of speechless because there was so much detail and so much history, and you taught me many things. So I just want to thank you so much for doing that. My pleasure. Yeah, I am so fortunate to know so much about my dad's World War II history and about his crew and what happened, you know, and most years, not last year because of COVID, I go around the country attending air shows, signing copies of my book, and I do a lot of PowerPoint presentations to various uh, organizations. And I, you know, the vast majority of people I meet, they know very little about their veteran because their veteran didn't talk about the war. Yeah, you're and right. So, they did yeah, I, I, I am so blessed to uh, have no, I'm so much. thankful that you took the interest to find out. Well, just one thing led to another. It's, uh, it, it's changed my life since I wrote the book. And uh, I can't wait to get back to Belgium 
every time I go to Belgium, I learn a little something new that I didn't know before. It, 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 it's incredible. I, I just wish that you know more people were able to know the particulars of, about their their veterans experiences because as I said, they are the greatest generation. They really are. And that's why I was so excited about it. You telling your story, you know, 3% being left. That's why it's so important that we do what we do, you know, building a World War II education center, restoring the lazy lady. Hey, and by the way, if you haven't been on a B-17, there's going to be one in the Salem airport, August 30th through September 7th. So Sentimental Journey is coming to town. So we're very excited. Um, and you can see that inside, that pathway that you showed that's so thin. <laughs> yeah, it, it's eight inches wide, that catwalk. Eight inches? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have a winner. Oh, you are kidding me. Stanton Ricky, you win the book. Stan Stanton Ricky is a hundred years old. He's a oh. World War II B-17 pilot. Oh my word! A veteran of three wars. He's a very good friend. We love him so much. He tells great stories. <laughs> I love it. Fabulous. Okay, Stanton, I'll be sending that to you. <laughs> so anyway, we are going to resume Veterans Coffee Club on. June 17th, so I hope you can come on the 10, 10 a.m. Thursday the 3rd, 3rd Thursday, sorry. Um, August 14th, we're going to have a fly-in at the Salem Airport. It's a one-day event, fly-in for food, tours, and the American spirit. And then, of course, August 30th through September 7th, is the sentimental journey. And we'll have a Veterans Appreciation Day and lots of great tours. So we have one more thing to do to close. I know you're gonna enjoy it. Just wanna thank everybody again for being here. Thank you, Steve, so much. It was awesome. My pleasure. I, you know, what you're doing the B-17 Alliance, restoring a lacy lady, you know, that's living history right there. It, it just, I admire what you're doing so much. Thank you. It's a big job, but I'm honored to do it. Really, I am. So uh, you can buy the books on our website and you get $4 off with your members discount. Signed copies. Signed copies. Yes. Okay, roll them. Like most World War II veterans, my dad didn't talk a lot about the war. Growing up, I knew the basics. I knew it was a B-17 pilot. His plane was named the Susan Ruth. He flew bombing missions over occupied Europe. And on February 8th, 1944, his plane was shot down. I had a wonderful relationship with my father. He was a tough guy, you know, kind of a no-nonsense guy. We compared him to John Wayne. He was that type of character. My parents grew up in an area with tough times. They went through the Depression, and they were tough people as a result of that. World War II came along, and there was no other event in history that affected more people. When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, the country rallied. They believed in their cause, and they were willing to sacrifice all to achieve victory. Flying combat was incredibly dangerous. The average number of missions flown before being shot down was six. For these guys to keep going up, you know, on mission after mission, knowing that the next one could be their last, took a lot of bravery and a lot of guts. I got shot down on my eighth mission. I was up in the air. They came in about one o'clock, 
They just made one pass. Move up. Two of my men were killed in the plane. Two evaded capture. I was one of them, and my tail gunner was the other. And then three of them got down safely, but they were picked up by the Germans, and they were interrogated, and then they were marched out in the woods and shot in the back of the head. Three Belgian farmers saw the chute open, and they came running over, and they threw me a rope, pulled me up to the tree, and got me out of the tree. And one of them took me off into the woods and hid me. They were different personalities, of course. Some of them were brave, some of them were scared to death. The ones that were scared of hiding you while they moved you they, they move you pretty quick. The ones that didn't uh, weren't scared, I mean, you might stay there six weeks. They risked not only their lives, but the lives of their family and friends. If the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out about it, they'd be arrested, tortured, and either sent to a concentration camp or shot. And some of the people that helped my dad and, and his other members of the crew met that fate. Word came that the Allies had landed at Normandy on June 6th. So he knew they'd be coming up through France to liberate that area. His Belgium helpers accompanied him over the Belgian border into France and joined up with a unit of the French resistance called the Mackey. They would disrupt communication, sabotage railroad lines, uh, attack convoys, assassinate German officers. And so he fought with them for uh, a couple months. The very first hours of the uh, 2nd of September 1944, few jeeps uh, of the reconnaissance party of the 60s infantry regiment crossed the border and there the Belgian population were waiting for, for the liberators. They were waiting that for four long years and uh, they saw the liberators coming in and uh, they were waving, they had uh, flowers. It was very uh, happy days for all people of Belgium. Word came that there were uh, US troops in a nearby village of Trelon, France. So he walked into the village, into the town square, up to an uh, army major. My dad identified himself, and that ended his seven months of missing in action. The Belgian people saw firsthand the atrocities committed by the Nazis. To this day, they are so grateful and so thankful still for the Americans coming to their rescue and liberating them from Nazi oppression. My father, Paul Delahaye, started the Belgian-American Foundation in 1984. It was for the 40th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium. The GIs who had been killed deserved the right to, to, uh, to be honored and to, to receive homage from us because they gave their life for, for us. Every year they have ceremonies at these various memorials that they've erected in the area on the anniversary date of those events. But the big celebrations are always on September 2nd, the anniversary date of the liberation of Belgium. Your father came the first time in 1988. I remember him when he came the, the, the first time because we were very young. So that was the Americans. We had never seen Americans, you know? <laughs> so that was a bit crazy. In 1994, I took my first trip to Belgium uh, with my parents. There was an event there were hundreds of people in this hall and we were a little late arriving. My dad walked in and the entire place stood up and started applauding. And it was really moving. You know, they treated him like he was the president of the United States. It was, I have never forget it. I got a whole new appreciation for my dad because, you know, I knew these stories, but you know, you hear the stories, but you know, they're not that personal to you. But when you're there and you've seen these places where the events took place, been in rooms where my dad was hidden. Thing that he was right here. He climbed out this window to get up on this roof. I mean, the history is preserved right there. The locals really saved my dad's life. It's a war we fought together. He came here to liberate my country. Why wouldn't I help him? I corresponded with him from the time I got back to the States until they died. They're wonderful people. They're brave people. I mean, they risk their life to keep you from being captured.
My parents had kept a lot of material from the war. There were two items that were really significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action. And the other item were all the letters that my dad wrote to my mother during the war that she had kept. And sitting down one time, spending several hours reading these letters, and I just became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it needed to be told. People needed to hear about it, and so I decided to write a book. Shot Down focuses on one crew and what happened to each member of that crew. That it just makes for a fascinating story, one that hasn't been told. All that the U.S. military knew was that my dad's plane was shot down by two Falk Wolf German fighters. And I just assumed that's all I'd ever know. One day, during my research, my wife Glenda said, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot him down? But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do, and I found Hans Berger. He's 95 years old now. He lives in Munich, Germany. Here's a picture of a Hans. Picture of... Well, that's pretty neat. As your plane, your picture, yeah. and your autograph. The young people of today, they have no idea what our life was, what the time was, what, uh, what difficulties we had, and that we were not all evil Nazis, but we were people like you and me, and uh, we just grew up in, in different spheres. On this 8th day of February, your father and me met, <laughs> and we shot each other down. <laughs> I've been asked several times, like, well, don't you hate this guy that shot down your dad's plane? But uh, no. Well, good for you. From the very get-go, I felt a personal relationship with Hans. He was 20 years old. He was fighting for his country, just trying to do a job and trying to stay alive. And World War II was the defining moment in my father's life. Really, I think it's the defining moment for any guy's life who fought in World War II. This oh. Yeah. And Hans is a part of my dad's life, a part of uh, his story. And so I had no ill feelings toward Hans, and uh, we become friends. Never thought that I'd meet the, the son of a guy I shot down. Yeah, well, I never thought I'd meet you either. Incredible. <laughs>
<laughs> I just want to say thank you so much. God bless you all and God bless America. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night.